Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to Spread the Word, North Carolina. And on tonight, we will be continuing our Bible study on the parables. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to say a quick word of prayer, and we'll go straight into the scripture. So we're going to be going to Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 20. Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 20. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, God. We just give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise for all that you've done and who, that you, who you are, Father God. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us on today. Father God, we just want to give you thanks for those things that we have not even acknowledged you for. And God, we just want to praise and lift up your holy name. Father God, as we come gather together on tonight to hear your word, to get more understanding, more clarity of what your word, the directions that you have for our life, Father God, I pray that you'll pierce the, de the depths of our hearts, Father God, that you will pluck up anything that is not like you, Father God, anything that will hinder us from hearing what you have to say to us, Father God. Now, God, I pray that you'll touch the ears of everyone that is in this place, everyone online that may be listening to this word, Father God, that they may hear you through me, Father God. Lord, I ask that I would decrease it, that your spirit would increase even the more, Father that it would spread out and stretch out on the inside of me, Father God, that it may touch and overflow and stretch out in your people, Father God. Let your word come forth with anointing and power on tonight, Father God. Let your people receive what it is that you have for him, Father God. Let no ear gun un no ear go untouched, Father God. Let no heart go un unchanged. And Father God, we just give you the glory. We thank you for those who are on their way, Father God, that you would give them traveling mercies. We thank you for those that are online, Father God, for their patience and their, and their commitment to the ministry, Father God. Now, God, you do a new thing on tonight. We receive your word. We claim the victory on tonight for what you will do. So, God, we forever give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we are at Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 20. Now, most people, when you see this parable, it is called the, the heart of man. Um, in some other translation, it is called um, defilement. So we'll start here, and then we'll go straight into our understanding of the scripture. Amen? And the word reads, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth of that, not that which goeth into the mouth defiles a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth that defiles a man. Then came, him, came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto them, declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, are ye also yet without understanding? Do not yet ye understand that whatsoever in its enters into a man to the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the drought but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts murders adulteries fornications thefts false witness blasphemies these are the things which defile a man but to eat with unwashing hands defile a man not amen may the lord add a blessing to the readers hearers and doers of his word so I know many have heard this parable before. Many may have not have recognized that it was a parable, but it is one because as we've seen so commonly in the other parables that Jesus has shared with the multitude and disciples, he goes and he talks to them, and then they come to him asking for a deeper understanding. So for those of you who have heard this scripture who are familiar with it, what has been your understanding of what Jesus was saying to us in this moment? It wasn't rhetorical, Trent. It was, it was a real question. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to say all that. Um, it was just him saying that not washing your hands doesn't make you unclean, that it's your works mm -hmm. that, that make you unclean, and that they shouldn't judge the people who didn't wash their hands because they're just as defiled as, as the people who didn't. Mm. You had something, Whitney? <laughs> pre-covid trend <laughs> pre-covid right so jessica is right here um but and when we look at this 
some of the things that we, we come to, because over this month, we've covered quite a few parables, right? Some that you've heard, some that you haven't heard. And even without, with all this, I encourage you to go back through and read the ones that we've read already and even go study some of the other ones that are available. Yes, some of them are a imitation of what's written in Matthew. We know the disciples copied off, copied off each other. Um, but, but still and yet, the texts are there in different, um, they're able to tell it from their different perspectives. And when we look at this text, we see Jesus calling the multitude to him so that he can share his wisdom with them. And he proceeds to educate them on how someone really defies himself. Um, and in my sanctified imagination, this is how things work with, with me. When God sent Jesus to the earth, um, I believe they had a conversation up in heaven. And I think the conversation went something like this. Will you look at them jokers down there? They talking about what you eat is the real problem with that defiles you. Like what you eat, like that's the real issue. Let me go down there and set these fools straight. This is my sanctified man. This is how, how I interpret. This is how the word comes to life for me, right? This is what we've got to do with the word. You make it come to life for you. And so Jesus, I imagine Jesus looking down on some of these pompous people who thinking they're proud of themselves, but I don't eat meat. I'm non-GMO or, you know, all these different labels that we have for today for what makes us better than the next person, especially when it was regarding the things that we put into our mouths. Right. But then Jesus is coming to saying, OK, well, it ain't got nothing to do with what you put in your mouth. And so he had to set the people straight because in those times, the Jewish people were acting as if they were better than someone else because they had positions for some, but also because of where they were in society. And most of the times you will see when it, is, when it talks about what people eat, I'm imagining that some people, that meals were all oftentimes a family thing or one that was important where you were able to see where others were eating because otherwise how would you know what's defiling, what's going in my mouth that's, be, that's defiling me? So just like then, as is now, there are believers who think that they're in a better position spiritually than those they look down on because they're doing this one thing in public, but behind closed doors, they're a hot mess. Um, especially rampant in society today, we talked about in one of our first or second Bible studies, I think, uh, we talked about how we categorize sins, right? Of uh, This sin is bigger than this sin. Well, well, I can see what they're doing, you know, homosexual. I'm like, that's a big one. That's a big one. But me over here with cursing, I'm, I'm okay because don't nobody always hear me cursing, right? Because I, I, So I'm good. So we have these categories of what it should look like, but <laughs> then we hear Jesus just as, I'm, this is how I imagine the word as I'm reading it. They're walking towards this elevator saying, okay, let me leave this peasant floor. I'm going to go up another, another floor above them because this is where I belong. And I imagine Jesus coming and stepping his foot right at the door as soon as it's about to close. Saying, ah, 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 wait, wait, wait. I know you think that what you eating is the big issue, but it's not. It's actually what's in your heart that makes your spirit stink. And I know a lot of times when we hear these messages, especially when it's talking about our heart and we think that we are in a place that we're not, um, offense tends to run rampant, right? We kind of get into this move, well, they ain't talking to me. <laughs> Praise him, Trent. Praise him. <laughs> we tend to get in this space of thinking that nobody's talking to me. <laughs> yes, Trent. Out of our subject, but I need to ask: you, Is cussing a sin, or is cursing? I know cursing is bad. C U R, mm -hmm. but is C U S a sin? What's C U S? All, break down the definition. Yes, okay, please. Okay, 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 okay. Mm -hmm. Cursing, mm -hmm. in my definition, in my opinion, uh -huh. is. <laughs> Is when you wish death on people, or ill will on pe on a person, or sickness on a person. Where you, I hope you die. That's to that, that, to me, is. that is cursing. But in the black culture, cussing is a couple of words that we use to express emotions, feelings, <laughs> or activities, <laughs> which add character to either sentence. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. So hold your horses, Trent. We're going into that later, right? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes, we will. So, <laughs> so we get to this place where 
where we, where Jesus is kind of coming to say, okay, let me check you real quick because your understanding of this thing ain't right. And so, and it was just like, this is what I kind of characterize. Oftentimes we hear someone tell us something that someone else tells us, not our partners, because oftentimes our partners tell us something we don't really agree. But if you hear someone saying something to you and somebody else says the same thing, I'm like, well, we need to check that because something about us stinks. And so... When I'm looking at this word and I'm seeing like, okay, what, what, what does this mean? Because this, this is what Bible said about. We're breaking this thing down, understanding it from our level so that we can know, okay, when this comes up again, this is what this means. This is what this means to me. So when he first goes in here, we're talking about defilement, right? So defile means to make profane, which is making something secular rather than spiritual, are devoted to that which is not sacred. Now, here we see here, oh, we're we going to get deeper into this. Here we see here, verses 10 through 14, the idea in Judaism was that eating the wrong type of food deprived a man of holiness and ultimately the acceptance of God. And during this time, Jew, Jew, Jewish leaders showed offense at these deliberate contradiction of their own teaching. So when Jesus came and said, okay, no, it's not what, comes, what you put in your mouth that defiles you, it's what comes out of your heart. It was contradictory to what they had been telling people. They're going around this whole time preaching and teaching. No, mm, you can't eat that. If you eat that, then God will not receive you. <laughs> Come on now, Whitney, preach it. <laughs> so he's sitting here teaching us that, okay, no, 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 no. We've got this wrong. And he's correcting what they have been taught, which we see a lot of times don't really happen in society because to correct the wrong teaching, oftentimes we feel like someone is slandering either the Bible or the individual rather than the thing that is taught. If I'm being taught something wrong, I want to know the truth. So if I'm living my life thinking that because I eat a certain type of food, God ain't hearing me, then that's a whole lot of people that may be lost, right? Because they're thinking, well, God ain't hearing me anyway. Let me go in and continue in this sin because God ain't hearing me. So then Jesus comes and said, no, 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 no. You got it wrong. And this is what I love about Jesus. Some, some may see this some kind of, um, um, some people will call this messy. Jesus is like, uh-uh, y'all come here, come here. He called the multitude and like, come, come in. Let me tell you something, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Um, it ain't what you eat that defile you. Is what come out of your heart. Imagine the Pharisees clutching their purse. Like, how dare he? How dare? And so we get to this place where Jesus is saying, okay, no, 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 that's not it. And then he, we see, as oftentimes, the disciples running behind Jesus and saying, okay, you know that they mad at you, right? Like, why did you do this? You knew that was going to upset them. And Again, in my sanctified um, imagination, I hear Jesus like, and? So what? Tell them to go on about their business. You go on about your business as well. But because Jesus is so gracious, he explains to them that everything that, they pl that was planted in their heart that is not from God is going to be rooted up. So everything that the Pharisees taught that was not the word of God, Jesus is coming to let them know, mm -mm, that's going to be destroyed real soon. The Pharisees and their religion along with it. Imagine someone coming to tell you everything you learned was wrong. God going to destroy that and you one day. And I think sometimes when we look at this, we don't really look at the magnitude of what was happening here. Exactly. We've got this teaching coming that's telling you, you got to eat this. You got to walk like this. And we've seen more than once that Jesus coming back and talking about it's not what you're eating that's the problem. And I think a lot of times this is what happens. If we look at this thing spiritually, it's not just what you're eating spiritually that's the problem. It's what's coming out of your heart. Because you may be eating a great feast, but what's in your heart, if you have not rooted that thing up and plucked it out, then you're going to be spitting venom into everyone around you. So this is where it comes into, and I often look at things from the, perspective of a lot of people who deal with church hurt 
I have clients that come in, deal with church hurt. I've got friends who come in, deal with it. And a lot of times it's because something that was planted that was not of God caused an offense in that person's life. And that person chooses to walk away from being a part of God's body because what was planted, it don't sound like God. But I have been convinced, or if I try to say that that's not God, then I look like the rebellious one, right? I look like I'm going against the grain. I look like I'm the one who don't know Christ because for some reason, everybody else believes this. Exactly. Religion instead of relationship. And that's why we see in here, Jesus telling them, no, God's going to come back and destroy the Pharisees and their religion. Because a lot of times we think that this walk with Christ is about religion when it's really about relationship. And we miss God in it because we're so focused on these traditional things. And, I, and one of the things that <laughs> and us being here is spread the word. We know that traditional things are honored, but it is not the backbone of what this church is, of what ministry is. Those structures are needed Absolutely. But if our sole focus is on following this thing, this thing like this, just so that we can make it to heaven, then where's the liberty in that? Where's the freedom in that? And so he gets to this place and letting them know that, okay, but these are blind people. And those who are following them are blind always, also. So the blind lead the blind. They both fall in a ditch. So when we hear this, what are some things that come to your mind, even in some of your own personal walks, that kind of bring up this thing in you like, oh, crap, like I've I seen myself there before. Have I been through that? What have some of your experiences been like with things like this, of being told that something is not godly or something is not right, but you believe in your heart that it is, but you feel attacked because everybody else agreeing with it? Um, I've always felt that way with appearance um I've always been like um I don't know the proper word maybe like um like not pressure but just like boxed in mm -hmm. like um it was frowned upon to wear like bright colors you know or to dye your hair or to get your ears pierced oh, or to wear pants or even to cut your hair um, tattoos, like, um, I've even been judged, like, the weird thing is, I'll be judged by people who also have them, but because they got saved after, you know, and, and didn't get any more, you know, they're like, oh, well, every time I see you, you got a new one, you know, <laughs> or like, it's like, why is your hair blue? You know, or it's like, oh, you wearing lime green on a Sunday, you know what I mean? And it's just, it makes you feel shame and it makes you feel like, oh, maybe I'm not that holy, even though you really are living right and you're not hurting nobody or hurting anything. Mm -hmm. And it makes you feel like it's a sin, but it's not. Right. It, it, it's not a sin to dye your hair. It's not a sin to wear bright colors. Um, I don't, I don't believe it's a sin mm -hmm. to, you know, sport tattoos or, or have piercings. Mm -hmm. And I feel like everything is okay within moderation. And I feel like that doesn't make me less holy. Less holy. That doesn't make me, you know, that doesn't taint my mm -hmm. relationship with with God. And and I'm going a, I'm to a keep getting them. You, you just going to have to stare. Cause, <laughs> yeah, because I guess because I was so suppressed you know, mm -hmm. growing up that now I take every opportunity to be my authentic self and to express myself in in the ways that I want. And I'm thankful I'm at spread because y'all em embrace that. You know what I mean? And y'all embrace me. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Trent. I just wanted to touch on what um, Jessica just said. I was sitting here listening to you and I was thinking, I don't know the exact verse, but I know mm -hmm. it's in the book of Leviticus because it was brought to my attention the same thing that she said you know oh you know you're not going to make it to heaven you know you have the, the body piercings you have body full of <laughs> tattoos and you know so um like you said you know I was offended so I used to tell them like okay well you talking about my tattoos um you have a ear full of earrings yourself you know and I'm like and um I mean and I know it might be a little TMI 
But um, it also says in the book of Leviticus 2, which I used to bring to their attention, um, a woman should not have sex seven days before or after her monthly because therefore she is unclean. I'm like, mm -hmm. but I don't see y'all waiting 14 days before y'all do what y'all do, so don't try to come for me. You know, because because of my appearance, they felt like I don't know, I don't know the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. No, I don't, but I do know some things. Right. And it's like just like you're quoting from Leviticus. Let me continue to keep quoting from Leviticus mm -hmm. because this is what it says. <laughs> now, before you come for me, check yourself. <laughs> yes, I love it. Um, <laughs> um, but no, it's to pick and choose for me. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like Celeste. You know, you want to talk about this over here, but you don't want to touch that over there. You know, you applying whatever you want to apply, and I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. So my, I had personal experiences with that as well, but that's why I'm here at Spreading the Word, because I have a pastor that's going to rightly divide the word. He's not, a, he's not going to condemn me. So it was just me being in a situation where I knew that, okay, I'm looking at this. This is Old Testament law. These Some of these things that you're talking to me about, you know, um, God is looking at my heart. I'm mm -hmm. looking at what he said to me specifically, you know, in the New Testament and things like that. So, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I'm not going to go by the things that's in the Old Testament, you know, but at the same time, it's just a different understanding. And I need yeah. to be under someone that has that same understanding or that can at least set me straight in certain areas to give me the word and rightly divide the word. Mm -hmm. So I've had experience as well. See, I, I don't think... I've had that experience. I think I've been on the other side. I was the person <laughs> telling you. Come on, Trent, tell the truth. So, um, but I would say, you know, being here, it's it's different for me. So the things that y'all say are freeing, I trouble with because I have been mm -hmm. indoctrinated on that principle mm -hmm. of you got them tight pants on. Now you know you ain't supposed to have that devil makeup on. And and all yeah, that's I'm, I, I'm straight Pentecostal all the way through, and we couldn't you know watch movies and stuff like that and subtle th certain things we laid down to the side. But for me, I was so old school. I'm seriously, I I told Pastor this first time first time I came to church, I said they're going to hell, and I'm not coming back to that church. But the word will will challenge your your belief your and I say your belief. Because what you believe may not be word or scripture or, or God. And every time I would come, he would, he would say something. So he got a little point there. I, I can ignore the first lady this, this Sunday because it was first lady. <laughs> but I love her. I love her now. But I, wherever she at, wherever she at. Uh, anywho, but I think, it's, I think everybody goes through it. It's just a different because on the other side, you do have some correction with yourself. Like, yeah. you know, you're not God. You can't put nobody in heaven or hell. And I still deal with it. You know, I still look at certain people and say, uh, Trent, help me, help my understanding. Yeah. I know this, that ain't right. That ain't right. I do it every time I have to push myself past what I've been taught because I've been doing this. I've been learning that for 20, 26 right. years. I, I, it's hard for me to undo 26 years of teaching, but I know it can be done. I think, first of all, I'm so proud of y'all. Y'all just, um, I think, but I think one of the things that we have to keep in perspective is this is the beauty of Christianity, yes. right? Jesus tells us that in Christ there is no more Jew nor Greek, yes. nor male nor female, right? So it's not so much about the stigmatism of trying to divide, but rather unify the body. And Paul says, if you feel like Trent, watch this. He says, if you feel like Trent, right, well, you still have convictions yes. about certain things, that's all right. If Paul says, if you don't have no convictions because you feel the, liber Come the liberty and the, and the freedom that yes. Christ gave you, yes. That, yes. That's, that's all right. right. But what Paul challenges Come us on. to do is Come to on. say to us, don't let that's your right. convictions become right. a stumbling block to, to her freedoms. That's right. And don't let your freedoms become a stumbling block to someone else's that's convictions. Good. That's what Paul is trying to get at yes. when he says, listen, if you want to fast seven days that's a week, right. 24 hours a day, and that's your conviction, so be it. But don't be mad at me. Don't dislike me. Don't hate on me when I get my cheeseburger, as long as I'm not eating my cheeseburger in your face knowing you're fasting. Do y'all hear what I'm saying here? 
So that is what Paul is, is meaning by what he says. Don't let yourselves become stumbling blocks to someone else's convictions. I think the other part of what you guys have mentioned is that the reality is, is people are going to use the Levitical law to identify things to your point that they have said, I'm not doing no more, and I find trouble that you still are able to do it. But if we want to read it in context, yes. the, the, the purpose and the intent of the entire Levitical law was to highlight that none of us could yes. do it right. Yes. Therefore, we all needed a savior. Right? It wasn't the point to say tattoos are worse than, than, than piercings or piercings are worse than, right? It was to teach us yes. how to relate, to, right, relate to, the, right. to our God. And because we did, there were so many rules that we didn't have the ability to, to make sure we, we lived up to them all. It was to show us that there was no way we could do this without holy or heavenly assistance to accomplish what it is that God in really intended for us. So what he says is now that uh, you, you realize you need a savior, mm -hmm. I'm ushering you into this time space of grace. Yes. Right? And people have defined grace in different ways, but yes. the grace of God right, uh, is, is, is where we reside now. Now y'all again, y'all know my theology as it relates to grace. I'm not a hyper gracious. I'm not saying grace gives you the ability to right. go and do whatever you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it. No. But the true mark of Christianity, and I'm going to leave this back to Elder Angie mm -hmm. or, or, or Whitney if you want to share. The true mark of your Christianity, it should be liberty, not bondage. Right. Yes. Y'all hear me? The, the, the real mark of your Christianity ought to be the liberty you feel, <laughs> not the bondage that's being imposed upon you. Because Jesus came, he says, I'm anointed to preach the gospel, right? To set the captives free. free. That's right. Not, not to put people in chains and yep. put people in more bondage. He didn't come for that. He came to set those who were already bound free. So when we move into Christianity, yes. I'm not saying we have liberty to do whatever we want to do because the Bible in context says mm -hmm. for us to know to do right and not do it, it is sin, sin mm -hmm. right? So, so we don't have the liberty to do what we want to do, but we have the freedoms to understand that Christ died for everything. He, he knew what you would do and what yes. you wouldn't do, what you would get and what you wouldn't get. But again, to you guys' point, God's emphasis is on the relationship and the status yep. with your heart rather than the relationship and status with your skin, your skin tone, your skin piercings. Yep. And so I think we have made God care about a lot more things that God don't really care about. That's right. And that's that's mm -hmm. the that's the, the <laughs> underlying foundation of theology is that it's man's yes. Yes. thought process and interpretation of God. And there's a lot of people teaching theology that don't have a relationship with the, Come on. the theos, Come on. the God, the divine. Right. There's a lot of people that claim to be theologians, but don't have a relationship with the God that the, yes. of the theology. And so it's important to understand it's our our synopsis and our conclusion of. Of, of, of God. It's right. man's interpretation of God. Yes. And I think we have made God care about a lot more things than I think he really don't care about. Bastard, I'm being all over my notes over here. <laughs> go ahead, Whitney. No, go ahead. Let's get to your point. <laughs> so when we go into, if we look at Romans 3 and 20, it says, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law came to make us aware of sin, not to hold us bondage to it. To it. And a lot of times what you guys are saying is that we were, things are taught to us to put us back, as Pastor was just saying, into bondage. But no, it's to make you aware of those things that are maybe not as favorable to God. Favorable to God. Mm. love when you're correcting you know or mm -hmm. you're noticing things that needs to be said it will be received differently yeah. you know and I think that's very important and that is some of the reason why some people feel the way they feel yes. when they're hearing that they may be saying something that is absolutely true yeah. you know but it's just how the approach yes so we're looking down at verses um, 15 here when Jesus was saying, you know, we, we know the blind need the blind. They both fall into a ditch. Um, Jesus was kind of teaching how erroneous that teaching was of that. Well, that don't make sense, y'all. 
And, and I think one of the things when we look at, like I said, I wish you guys can read the Bible the way I'll be reading it in my head. Is that, <laughs> is that when, when Jesus is coming, he's like, okay, but that's not what I said. But oh, let me tell you all the truth. And sometimes what happens is we come, we see the Pharisees were offended because Jesus came and went against what they had been teaching. You know, sometimes we feel, well, we're on the same team. Why we ain't teaching the same thing? Because we're, always, we're not always connected to the same God. Sometimes our God is ourselves and our own beliefs, not the righteousness or holiness of God. And so Jesus is coming to say, okay, that ain't holy. That don't make you holy what you eat. But he said those things that are in your heart. And let's go into this. So Jesus is looking at this and he's saying, um, what I love about verse 15 is we see Peter, who oftentimes we see is the sacrificial lamb who comes to ask Jesus the question. It's often Peter who's come, well, look, let, me, let me come whisper in the ear, Jesus. And, <laughs> and so Peter comes for the group, actually saying, well, Jesus, break this down a little bit. And so Jesus then elaborates on what, he, what should have been self-explanatory. And so he says that these things, um, in verse 16, he says, are you, are you also without understanding? Let me, let me read this from a different version because I, 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 I like this. Oh, you got one? Yeah, Jesus said, you have trouble understanding. Mm-hmm. And so this is, this is one of the ones that I, I like, <laughs> the NFT. It says, don't you understand that whatever? No, he says, Jesus said, even after all of this, are you still so foolish don't you understand that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and then passes out into the sewer? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these things defile a person. For out of the heart come evil ideas, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are the things that defile a person. It is not seating with unwashed hands that defiles a person. And I look at these scriptures, and I'm like, okay, God, we need to break this down a little more. Um, because when he's talking about the things that come from the heart or the things that defile us, I think a lot of times we think that we are okay because we think my heart is great, tied to Jesus. And some, so Jesus is coming to break this down to them like, okay, no, 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 it's not what you're eating. These are the things that defile you. And he says, evil thoughts. Don't need much explanation there, right? We know what an evil thought is. We, even as a saved person, you think evil thoughts, you know, God, just strike them down right now. That's an evil thought. That ain't, that ain't godly. I mean, it feels like it should be, but it ain't. So then there's murders. Murder is the unlawful, premeditated killing of one human by another person. Pretty explanatory. Then he said, <laughs> adulteries. Adultery is voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and a person who is not his or her spouse. He said, that come out of your heart. Fornication is intercourse between two people that are not married. Hmm. We all been there before. Praise Jesus. Help us all. Thefts. This is the action or crime of stealing. Then here go one. Ooh. False witnesses is one who stands up and swears before others that something untrue is true, especially with the intention of hurting someone else or ruining their reputation. Another word for that is a liar, and not just a liar, a <laughs> someone who has lied or lies repeatedly. So this is what we, he's saying, this is the fault. This is those things of the heart. These are the things that corrupt you, right? So then he says, here we go, Trent. <laughs> Blasphemies, which is the act or offense of speaking about, secret, speaking sacrilegiously. Sacrilegious means violation or misuse of what is regarded as sacred, about God or sacred things. It's irreverence, profanity are taking the Lord's name in vain. <laughs> Communication come out of 
He said, death and life cannot flow out of the, out of the same fountain. Also, the words that you know, yes. Yes. Profanity. Right. Blasphemies. Blasphemy is considered profanity. <laughs> the crime or of insulting or showing lack of reverence for God. <laughs> so we see that this irreverence is also um, showing lack of reverence for God and its doctrines and writings. And that's what Pastor was talking about. This is the blasphemy, and we don't co- want to consider these things as what they are. Because if you're teaching erroneously, then you're teaching blasphemy. If you're teaching against the word of God, which is what we see the Pharisees was doing here, you're blasphemy. And yes. So there's a duality of responsibility there, mm-hmm. meaning that there, th- that the person who's up here teaching, right, knowing, on, sir. knowingly or unknowingly, is going to have the responsibility of what they're allowing to come out of their mouth across whether they're intending to deceive people or not. Right, they're going to have to answer for that. But I think also, even the people in the pew, you have a responsibility to guard and protect your ear. So I'm cautious and I'm concerned about people who who sit under poor, the ignorant or blasphemous teaching, and are content with not searching it out in the scripture, not studying it for themselves. And not making a what I would call a a, a, a d- divine judgment, right, mm-hmm. or, or or a a sound doctrinal judgment yeah. about what it is that if so, so let me put it in practical uh, practical terms for you. If pastor stands up there on Sunday on. and I tell you that Jesus didn't do this, mm-hmm. and you say okay, and you come back next week for me to tell you Jesus didn't do this again and again and again. Not only do I have a responsibility to God for accounting for what I said, you have a responsibility for one, not correcting pastor, right? Our brother and sister in our erroneous ear, right? And, our, and then finding a place for proper, for lack of better terms, exegetical th- thesis, right? Or, or exegetical teaching for your continued growth. You should not allow me to tell you Jesus didn't die for you. Then you come back next Sunday and allow me to tell you Jesus didn't die for you. And then you start believing and being okay with the fact that Jesus didn't die for you. No, you got a response. Yes, Lord. You said that? That's Holy Ghost. (laughs) Holy Ghost grabbed her. You got a responsibility, right? You got a responsibility for yourself to say, I've got to study to show, not pastor, glory to God, Study to, that don't just apply to preachers. Come on, Come on here. Lord. That don't just apply to teachers. No. Paul says study to show yourself approved. So there is a level, a level of study you have to do yourselves. And if something is don't sound right that come across the pulpit, if something don't, don't sit right in your spirit, bring it up. Ask the question, right? That's fine. I'm okay with it. We'll, we'll, rightly, we'll get to the Bible and we'll let the Bible you know, yeah. rightly divide itself. Yeah. But there, I think in the black church, there has been a time mm-hmm. where people say, you don't question what pastors right. say. If he said it from up there, it yeah. is, it's the truth. Yeah. We go with it. And we have taught people to take on erroneous, false yeah. doctrines. And we have been inculcated. We have been steeped in doctrines that are erroneous. And then we grow up teaching our children the same false doctrine and blasphemous teaching that we receive. So I said, this is your responsibility. If you're in a place where there's poor teaching, you're not growing. Matter of fact, you just allow yourself to sit there and, uh, and decompose. If you, and if you sit there longer, God going to judge you just like he's judging the teacher. Yep. You, 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 didn't, you didn't realize that I died for you, but you sat 20 years and let that man tell you I didn't. It's your, he that hath an ear. I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> and people, people perish for the lack of, come on. People perish for the lack of knowledge. Like you just have, you cannot just sit there, you know, ask questions. You cannot just sit there and allow somebody to tell you something and just go with it. If it doesn't make sense, and then this is the problem that I have. I have a problem with the person when I want to ask you about it, then you want to get upset with me because I'm questioning what you're saying. No, you're supposed to do like you said. Sit sit me down, show it to me in a word, explain it to me. But if you can't explain it, you're just running your mouth. And at this time, I don't have time. 
and that is completely in line with what this text is saying to us here. He's saying the Pharisees were saying this thing. See, but the difference that we have now is we've got the written word with us. They had some scribes with them, right? The scribes were the ones who were right what Jesus was saying. So they had scribes with them, but we have the word with us every day. You got it in your phone. You take it to work with you. You come home. It's in your car with you. So there is no excuse why you cannot search this word out. This is what I was saying. This is why it is encouraged that when you come to church on Sundays and on Wednesdays, that you bring something to write with, that you are able to write down things that come across the pulpit. I had a, <laughs> a pastor one time used to be upset with me because I always took notes. You said something, my ears perked up. I'm, I'm writing. I'm on the front row. He's looking at me, and I'm looking at him like, continue, sir. Because I have the responsibility because guess what? I know one day I'm going to have a family and I have to make sure that they are getting the right word. Not what somebody else is teaching me, but what God has also spoken to me. Go ahead, Jessica. I was just going to say um, something about learning. Do you want me to punch you in the face? Oh, I'm sorry. Blasphemy. <laughs> I just I just reacted. I got upset. I thought he was making fun of me, and I got upset. <laughs> um, you got to be in person. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, forgive me, Jesus. So um, I was just going to say something about learning styles. So how I, how I learn is when pastor or you or, or anybody is speaking, I like, it may even seem intense, but I just stare so hard because I'm, I'm actively listening. Mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm taking notes, I, I feel like I miss it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like I miss major points. So it's like, I run through, you know, and I, and I, I absorb, and I, I and then the things that stick out to me, I'll just, cause I can type faster than I can write. So the, the things like there's, I literally have like, um, you know, like in the notes app, like in the notes app, I literally have like a quote, like full of pastors mm -hmm. quotes that like st st sticks out to me that I remember later. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I feel like that was really the spirit speaking. Cause you know, he always says like, if it don't hit you, it'll, it'll, it'll hit your heart. You know, it may not hit your heart right now, but it'll hit your heart later or whatever. So those are the ones that I write down. Cause I'm like, okay, that, that may have been speaking to me, but I, I can't, when y'all are talking just, just how I learn, I'm not going to retain that, that information. Like if I take notes at the same time, does that make sense? Right. So right. sometimes I feel bad cause y'all be like, take notes. And I'm like, but but I can't. <laughs> but you're right. Everybody processes in different ways. But there are people, even because it is recorded, so you can go back and you can you can rewatch it again. But sometimes what Pastor saying is we still sit up under those teachings and we don't say anything. It's we know it's wrong. And I think sometimes has been my um, testimony in many ministries of being rebellious because I questioned what the pastor was saying. I'm like, well, what does this mean? That wasn't my understanding of this. Can you help me understand? And just like you were saying earlier is that sometimes when you're asking for clarity, there is this challenge or this offense that comes. And what we see is that's exactly what happened with the Pharisees. Jesus came and taught something different and offense immediately rose up in him. And what happens um, is one of the things that, I, um, that the Bible talks about is that if any man offend, the same as a perfect man. So we're all going to be offended by something, but we need to make sure that when we are offended that it is we're offended because the truth has come forward, not because of someone else's personal doctrine. And so when we see here, um, Jesus is trying to help us understand that it is the heart that is desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17 and 9. Genesis 6 also says that, and I've said this scripture many times before, that God saw the people's heart and it was wicked continuously, continuously. That didn't stop once the Old Testament ended. That didn't stop once the New Testament ended. Our hearts are continuously wicked, and that's why we are to kind of, what, what God says, um, while we pray that creates in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit in me, because those things in our heart, there are some things in our heart that are rooted and planted deep down that we are unaware of. 
And so when Jesus comes and tells the Pharisees, um, I, I kind of question, um, and Pastor, you could probably get a little more clarity on this as well, is when the, when the um, disciples brought it to Jesus and said that they are offended, and Jesus was saying to them that, you're, that what they taught, which is not of God's, will be plucked out. out. I kind of feel that the Pharisees almost believed some of what the Pharisees had taught as well because they came and said, okay, they're offended. And I, sometimes, I think sometimes when we come to think, come bring things to, to our leaders about it and say, oh, well, the people are offended, it's because we're also offended by it. So we come and we say, okay, well, help us understand this because they were offended, but we don't include us in they, they, even though we are a part of them. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think that's a... I think that they, from a from a religious perspective and an, uh, a religious under, understanding or education perspective, when they came and were saying, hey, the people are offended or they were offended, um, I think twofold. One of the reasons that they were offended was because it opposed immediately what the way they were taught, right? right. And that's our that's our common offense yeah. because it's just not the way that I've been taught mm -hmm. and the way I've, I've been used to learning it. But I think subsurface, there was also a... a pendulum swing so to speak of the of the momentum moving from the from the religious leaders being the ones sitting in the in the high seats of authority to these people who seem to be following this man who had no uh, record of formal theological training or training in the you know in the the, the Talmud or the or the Midrash or the or the Torah right yeah. and and so it was like hey we're our, we are losing our grip on yeah. the, on influencing the people, yeah. and any time people begin to lose yeah. influence, they'll become offended as well yes. at the person who seems to be having the influence that they want. I think it goes back to the to the parable that you, you you encouraged us to talk about last week about how we 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 ought to get what's out of our own eye before we yeah. go to someone else's right. But a lot of times we see what's on other people, and in 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 our looking at them, it makes us feel as if we're yeah. missing something. So I think the Pharisees at this point, as they see the momentum switch right from them from them as religious leaders to Jesus, yeah. they begin to become offended because. What he's teaching doesn't make sense to them, and it seems like it's drawing more people to him rather than to us. And anytime y'all know, you y'all have seen this, especially in the social media age, where foolishness it seems like get more following than sound, doctrinal, educational, logical, right understanding things. So to them, what Jesus was saying sounded like foolishness. And and let's just put our even though it's not let's put them in that context of them looking at Jesus and what he's saying being foolishness and seeing the thousands of people begin to follow and trend and like right and share so it became offensive immediately, immediately to them because they felt like what they were talking and what they were teaching was the right way right. and what they're saying what Jesus was saying was foolishness to them and like you said anytime we feel like foolishness triumphs over our logic or our thought we'll become immediately offended um, so I think that's kind of where the Pharisees were at I think. Um, as you move to verse number 20, which is where I know you're getting ready to go, is going to answer Whitney's question, and then I'll, I'll comment kind of to that, to that piece as well. Yes. yes. So here we are, because we've only got a few minutes. It's verse 20 said, These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defile a man not. And so, Whitney, where you were asking, well, what does this all culminate into? It is yeah. that Jesus is saying that all those things that you thought were holy are going to be destroyed. Those ideolo ideologies that you have been planting inside these people, these years before I came, those doctrines that you grew up with, those things that you are still holding tight onto that are not in, in line with any part of what I say is holy or righteous, those things are going to be destroyed along with those who preach this division. And I know, I think sometimes um, I, I look at things and I, I, I often am concerned with um, different people in their mantles. Um, like I often tell people sometimes with my husband is that I have more grace for him because a long time ago, God showed me and helped me to understand the mantle that he has to carry as the head of our household. And I'm like, well, I don't want that because when my husband stands before God, he's got to give account for our family. I don't want to do that because, oh. And so what Jesus is showing here is that, okay, you have to give account for all this um, erroneous th t doctrine that you're teaching. And I think if we as believers would take this more, a little more to heart and with seriousness as it deserves, then we would be more likely to stand up and say, okay, help me understand it because that's not my understanding of the word. 
help. I, Okay, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. God, give me more understanding. Give me wisdom. Give me knowledge about what this thing is saying so that I don't go out teaching blasphemies against you as well. Because a lot of times we do take those things and we take those, you know, that, that um, like you're saying, wearing skirts down to the ground. Oh, that makes you holy. Okay, where is that in the Bible? Show me this. Or you can't wear nail polish. Show me this. And so we take those things and we hold on to them. And the thing is, when Jesus said that it is going to be plucked up from the root, that's the same thing we need to let the word do with us. It's kind of pluck those things that have been indoctrinated into us, pluck it out because it's not of God. And those are the things that keep us stagnant, that keeps us tied to those situations that we seem to keep running back and forth to. So I'm just going to say this and I'll, I'll give it over to Trent and Whitney. Amplify in verse 20 says this. These are the things which defile, what you said, and dishonor a man. So looking at it from the, this, this first century context, what, what Jesus says to them is these things, the end state of these is that it, it, would, it would make you, in their eyes, unclean before God, yes. right? 21st century, it, it puts us in transgression or broken fellowship with God yes. to the point where they, during their time, would have to go to the law sacrifice, do all these things to put them back in right standing with God. For us, that means we got to hit that repentance table, right? And say, okay, because what he's saying is that when the instead of all of these things that defiles us, it really puts us out of fellowship, right? Or in the place where re repentance is required for us to restore that right relationship, right? right. right? So I'm, that's, the way they're looking at it is the defilement, what do you do to get right back? In back and right standing, which was atonement, sacrifice, and all those things. For us, it's repentance that puts us back in right relationship. So while cursing, right, uh, or <laughs> cussing, like y'all said, whatever Trent once said. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The four-letter words that y'all like to use all the time. While, while that is, right, while that, for some people, is not, not a conviction for them. Right. But it ought be, right, as mm -hmm. we mature. Yes. For the immature believer, yes. it's not. But as we mature, it ought be conviction for us. And, and, and now a full understanding of says, if, if slanders put them in defilement mm -hmm. or out of right context with God, how are we any different? It's yeah. got to put us in some right, out, out of some right context with the Lord. How do we rectify it? Because I think we put a lot of emphasis, Elder Angie, on the sin and the defilement yeah. rather than the rectification mm -hmm. of the relationship. So now... In, 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 in our dispensation, we are, the gospel is this. The good news is that he came, died for us till we have right eternal life or right, right relationship, the grace of God, right? But I think we put the emphasis on, hey, the sin going to do this. It's going to make you defile. Okay, but what's the gospel? What is the good news of that? Our responsibility is to preach the gospel, yeah. is to preach Jesus. Yes, I know what sin is. I can tell you what that is. I can tell you what that means. But if I don't tell you how to rectify your sin, my preaching is unbalanced and it's broken. Because I'm charged not to preach sin, I'm charged to preach Jesus. Do y'all hear me? So, so when I get to the point where I tell you, yeah, you're wrong, you sinning, this and this and that. Okay, so what? Mm -hmm. So what's the so what of this? Right. The so what of it is that he died for you. And if you repent, 1 John 4 and 8 says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Yes. Now I got you back to the place where you're in right relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And that's the end state of our preaching, our teaching, our discipleship right. is to keep you in right relationship with yes. him. Um, I think another thing, like when I think about this situation and many other situations that occurred um, when Jesus came, it just makes me think about how much time was wasted mm. because there's so much time wasted thinking about this particular thing or, you know, specific laws and things. And souls were not being saved. You know, those people, it's like what happens after you've fallen into a temptation or what's happened after you have, you know, sinned according to the law. You know, who were those people, like who was going out? Nobody really, from what I could see, you know, going out to those different places, you know, the, the what do you call it, fifth quarter, red quarter, wherever some of those prostitutes and those drunks were, where Jesus made it his business to go to those places, you know. So even in this situation, it's just like by the time you go through all of that, and you're you're trying to search through and let me find this scripture and let me see this. Like, 
He is worried about your heart. Like, are you going to spend that much time to study your word? You know, you know, just to have a relationship with him. You too worried about my tattoos or my piercings. Like, I think it's just we're wasting a lot of time looking at the tit for tat when, like someone said before, that's not even what God is looking at. He's looking at your heart, you know, so it's a lot of time wasted. I think, you know, sometimes whenever we encounter people like that, you know, that wants to say something about your tattoos or your piercings or what you do or what you look like, you know, just put your focus on God. And the more that you focus on him, he's going to mature you. And just like he just said, you know, whatever God is going to deal with you and convict your heart about those things as you go along in your relationship. So just like we said last week, if it's something that, you know, God might be dealing with me about it, but he may not be dealing with Elder Angie about it. That doesn't make her any different from me. God is just dealing with me about it. And I think it needs to stick with us. And that kind of goes into what I said last week about kind of like minding your business. Now, I know we're supposed to tell each other, you know, what's right from, you know, what's right from right from wrong. But at the same time, it's just like, let God deal with you and where you are. And then, you know, let him deal with that piece. And maybe you will be used as a tool to help somebody else to get through that situation. But don't push them further, you know, by making them feel bad because they'd have it, you know, you know, stepped up like you have in a specific situation. Amen. And I'll close with this. And it said that for there is no sin in word or deed, which was not first in the heart. They all came out of man and are the fruits of wickedness, which is in the heart and is wrought there. It lives there. It's it's bred there. When Christ teaches, he will show men the, the deceitfulness and wickedness of their own hearts. He will teach them to humble themselves and to seek to be cleansed in the fountain open for sin and uncleanliness. That's saying, basically, worry about yourself. That's what he's saying. All of these things originate from the heart. Because we've got so much focus on the physical, what we see. But we're not looking at those things that are unseen because that's what God's looking at. So if God is looking at my heart, then I want to make sure my heart is as clean as possible. Will it be perfect? Absolutely not. But every day, exactly, I'm working out my own salvation. Every day I'm asking him to reveal to me those things that are buried in the depths of my heart which may be sin unto him, which may be causing him from hearing me. Because we've got some of those things that we're not even plugged into, and we think God is hearing us, but he's not because he says in his word, because I have regard iniquity in my heart, you will not hear from me. So we need to be able to be able to come to God and boldly ask, okay, God, show me those things in my heart that are hindering me from following you closely. Show me those things in my heart that are hindering me from hearing you, from being obedient to your word. And when we can do that... First off, focusing on that alone will help you worry about yourself. Because a lot of times our focus is on everybody else and the sins we can see. And God's like, mm-mm, it ain't about that. Focus on you. Yes, ma'am. Another thing I'm thinking about, too, is please don't allow tradition to push people away from the church. That's a thing that I have seen over and over and over again. And it's very hurtful because our job is to reach out to people and to win souls. It is not to look at the traditional thing. Oh, look at what she got on. We are missing the entire point of what ministry is all about. It's about getting those people in, showing them, I love you. I don't care what you have on. You know, I love you. And allowing God to work on them. Only thing we can do is give them Bible and give them word, and give them love, but it's not our job always to, you know, you know, chastise people, and ju- it's just not our job, yes. you know, we just got to show love, y'all. Amen, and for that, you know, even going back to the scripture, I encourage you all to read Matthew chapter 15, that talks, of, that talks about that also, um, about those things that we are doing that may be hindering um, those relationships in Christ, those things that we are condemning others about as well, so if there are no other questions or comments or concerns, I want to thank you all for joining us on, online. I pray that this word has helped you, that it, you have heard something from God that will push you to the next level in God's growth challenge for you. Amen. Be blessed.